So now we're up to where God is telling Moshe Rabbeinu to go to Egypt. We finally found out the real reason why he didn't want to go. What do we call tonight's, the name of our tonight's shmooz? Moshe and Aaron, two brothers with two great hearts. Which heart was greater? Here we have Moshe Rabbeinu, God coaxing him to go to Egypt. He doesn't want to go. And the real reason is because he doesn't want to take away the honor from his older brother, Aaron. Imagine that. God told him to go to the greatest thing in the world, take the Jews out of Egypt, bring them to Mount Sinai. No, I can't do that. It's not nice. It's not right. I have an older brother. It'll make him feel bad. That's where Moshe Rabbeinu's great heart wants to give honor to his older brother and not take the honor for himself. And on the other hand, God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, don't worry. He's going to come and meet you. He'll be happy that you came to such a great plateau of greatness that God's sending you. I feel so happy for you. So we have these two great hearts. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't want to make his brother feel bad. His brother is so happy that his brother is, that Moshe Rabbeinu is going to high heights of, of spirituality, close to Hashem. Two great people. And uh, that's why they were great, because they didn't think about themselves. They thought about the other person. What's, what's real greatness? Most people are worried about themselves and they're into it. What, what do I get out of it? We're the generation of the me generation. What will I get out of it? And great people say, no, what will the other person get out of it? I'm not, forget about myself. I want to help the other person. Where do we get this from? Where do we learn this from? From Hashem? We emulate God? God's not worried about himself. God doesn't need anything himself. He only does a whole day for others. He gives life and whatever we have in this world, any goodness, he's the one who gives it. So great people emulate God. They give to others. Worried about others, not about themselves. So therefore God said, number one, a very important Rashi. Samach Beliboy, we mentioned last week that God told Moshe Rabbeinu, you think he's going to feel bad? He's going to feel good, he'll be happy. His heart will be happy that he sees his brother going up to high heights of greatness. And because of this, Misham Zocha Aaron Adi Hacheshen Nosen Al Liboy. I have to give a little background for those who are not familiar with this, what these words mean. We know that there was a holy temple in the desert called the Mishkan. The Jews, 40 years in the desert, they had the Mishkan, a holy temple. They came to the Holy Land. King Solomon built the holy temple, the Beis HaMikdash, the holy temple, which stood for 410 years. 20 years. Was destroyed, and the other temple was built for another 40, 20, 30, 20 years, 30 years, 10 years longer than the first one. In that temple, in that holy temple, the high priest and all the priests served Hashem. They brought sacrifices and they did all kinds of services to Hashem. The whole coin wore eight. Eight different types. The secondary priest wore four, and the high priest, priest at a time, he wore eight. One of those that he, that the secondary priest did not wear was called the Choshen. The Choshen, the ornament of the Choshen. What was the Choshen? The Choshen was a woven garment made out of very nice colors, and was placed over the heart of the Kohen. And in that, on that, it was sort of a vest, call it, was, it didn't go around him, but it was just in the front, were 12 precious stones, diamond, and emerald, and uh, ruby, all precious stones. 
And each of those stones represented one of the 12 sons of Yaakov Avinu, the 12 branches of the Jewish people. And, and on every one of those stones was one of the names. Stone Ruvain, Shimon, Levi. They had their names engraved in those stones. And every one of those stones was characteristic of the shavit that was engraved in it. Each stone has its own flavor, its own type of personality. Stones have personality. And each one was synonymous with the name of the shavit that was engraved in that stone. And that Choshen, that was called the Choshen. Choshen was doubled over. The material had, was double. Inside of that double vest that we're talking about was Shem HaMafoyrish, the name of God that we're not allowed to even utter from our mouth, except in the Holy Temple, the Kahanim. And that's when they used to ask questions to Hashem. And they had a question to ask. They would go to the Kohen, would go to the, in front of the Choshen, and he would ask God, should we go to war? Should we not go to war? And the, all the names of the Shvatim, of the 12 branches, included the 22 <coughs> letters of the Aleph base. And God would answer the answer the question by lighting up the letter. Let's say say yes with Cain, Kof Nun. Should go to war, would say light up the letters Kof Nun. I said, God don't go, would say Lo, Lamad Aleph. Those would God would answer by lighting up the letters of the twelve Shvatim that were printed on those stones. And that's when the first temple, the second temple, they didn't have that because it was hidden away. They couldn't have it. So Aaron Cohen, since his life, his heart was so kind, benevolent, not jealous of his brother, and when he heard Moshe Rabbeinu, even though his younger brother than him, is going to take out the Jewish people from Egypt, Somach Belibai, his heart was joyful, was happy, God said, you and that schus, and that merit of, of, of your greatness, of your happiness for the other person, you don't care about yourself, you're not jealous of him, you're happy for him, so I'm going to give you the great merit, you will wear that choshen on your heart when you serve in the holy temple. That means that the 12 branches of the Jewish, Aruba, Shimon, Lev, Yehuda, were on his heart. That means he was the heart of the Jewish people, Aaron Cohen. When he served in the Holy Temple, we brought sacrifices when he prayed. The high priest, imagine how what a great man he was, Aaron Cohen. He had all the people of Jewish people in mind. He, they were in his heart. He felt for all of them. He prayed for all of them. They should have health and happiness and children and peace. And that was because he was the person with the right heart. He had heart for the Jewish people. And if people were suffering, he would suffer with them because they were on his heart. All the names of the 12 tribes, the 12 branches of Jewish people were on his heart to pray for their welfare, for the goodness, and to feel for their problems because he was a man with a heart. He, he, he felt for the other person. He wasn't selfish for himself. It was for everybody else. So that's why God said to Aaron Akoin, you since you feel such great feeling for your brother, Moshe Rabbeinu, you're happy for him, you care about the other person, you're not jealous for yourself, you will be the person who will get this great mitzvah of serving in the Holy Temple with that choshen on your heart, with the old Jewish people, with the precious stones with the names on it. So that's a very important idea for us to live with the same way that we have to learn from Aaron Cohen, not be interested only in ourselves. When we pray to Hashem, we have three times a day, we, we, Jewish people pray time three times a day, once in the morning, once at night, and once in the afternoon. 
Shachris in the morning, Mincha in the afternoon, Mariv at night time, Avris at night time. And we pray all kinds of prayers for happiness and for health and for parnosa, for livelihood and for, uh, for, for, for peace. We should not only keep ourselves in mind, we should learn from Aaron Akoin to think about others, not only ourselves, not only our own, own families, but other families, not only in this country, but all countries, wherever Jews are. We want to pray for all Jewish people, and we want even for the world, for mankind, there should be peace and people should be, uh, get along with one another, and we should think about what we'd like for ourselves to think of everybody else at the same time, not only be selfish for ourselves. This is a great thing we have to learn from this, what we're learning right now. This is what Aaron Akoin was. He was emulating God, like we said. God is only a giver, he's not a taker. Aaron Akoin was a giver. He was a happy for other people. He wasn't interested in selfish reasons in himself. And we also have to follow their footsteps to pray to Hashem for everybody, not only for ourselves. <coughs> Interested, feel the pain of other people. We have to feel the pain ourselves. We see other Jewish people in pain and having suffering. We should feel the pain ourselves also. Have a real Jewish heart. Of course, a lot of times uh, we meet people who say that they don't keep the laws of the Torah. They say, I have a heart. I have my a heart is a Jewish heart. Well, we have to have a Jewish heart. But I say to these people, if that's all God wanted from us, he would only credit us with a heart. How can we have anything else? Hands and feet and, and, and a head? He should credit us without. If we have to serve Hashem with our heart only, he would credit us only with our heart. Since he gave us hands and feet, we have to call, keep all the commandments of the Torah with all the all different limbs and parts of our body to keep all the mitzvahs. But we have to have that Jewish heart to, or the feeling for everybody else. So, that's number one on our sheet tonight. Number two, Shmais Yud Shvatim, following up what we said before. On that Choshen were the names of the 12 branches of the Jewish people, all 12 sons of Yaakov Avinu, that they were the different branches of the Jewish people living in the land of Israel, all parts of the land of Israel. Now, we find that finally Moshe Rabbeinu kept refusing till God finally God got angry at Moshe Rabbeinu. Number three. God got angry at Moshe Rabbeinu. Imagine that. He got angry. Why? You keep refusing. I keep asking you. And you know how many times Hashem asked him? This was the seventh day. Rashi tells us, it was the first day. Hashem came to number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven days, one after the other. God came to Moshe, made a burning bush. And Moshe came to the bush. And Hashem said, go to Egypt, take out the Jews. No, no. This reason, that reason, Hashem said, not a good reason, not a good, not a good reason. Finally, the seventh day, he's still refusing. So God finally got angry at him. Now, that's not a pleasant thought for God to get angry with somebody. I mean, what could be worse than that? What happens when God gets angry with somebody? Whatever that means, because God doesn't have anger. It means he acts like he's angry. He doesn't get angry. God doesn't have feelings of anger. But just we, we, we express it in such a way because that's what we live with. We get, people get us upset. We get angry. But God doesn't really get angry. But whatever it means, it means that he acts like as if he's angry. And, he's, and, and finally, the question is, what happens when God is angry? If we look through the Torah, whenever God is angry, there's a punishment. There's a punishment. God angry. It means he's not listening to God. And here we have a difference of opinion in the great rabbis in the Medrash. When God got angry, was there a punishment? There was much more punished because of this. You're refusing God seven days in a row. You don't want to go? He says, go, no, go, no, no. Was he punished? So one opinion in the Medrash says that we don't find any punishment. Why? If God's angry, how can he punish Rosh Rabbeinu? How can he punish him? He's not for himself. He's saying, send somebody else. I'm not worthy of going. I'm not great enough to go. 
I don't want to make upset my brother to go. So you get angry at a person like that. He, if he, he says, I want to go, so yeah, I want to go, I don't care. Okay, you get angry at him, you punish him. But if your child is, you have your own child, and you, and, and, you, and you ask him to do something, and he says, no, I don't want to do it because I'm not worthy of doing it. I don't want my older brother to get upset. But I'll give you a patch. You, you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't hit your child if they, uh, if they refuse because of such great, noble reasons. They, they're not for themselves. They're for, out for the other person. How do you, you get angry but you don't, you don't punish them? You get sort of frustrated. I mean, more than anger. Frustrated. Come on, yes, the child to do it. No, I don't want to hurt his feelings. I, everything because of thinking about the other person. See, how can you punish a person like that? So God's got saying, but punish him. How can he punish him? He's, he's such a great person, Moshe Rabbeinu, and, 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 and it's everything for the other person, not for himself. So this is the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu. If it wouldn't be, he wouldn't be Moshe Rabbeinu. He was so great, that's why he didn't want to take the honor for himself. So this opinion says, therefore God did not punish him, even though he keeps begging him to go for seven days, he keeps refusing, he couldn't punish him. The other opinion is, no, he was punished. Because even though you have very noble thoughts and you want to do the right thing, but God's telling you to do it, okay? You, as a person, you did what you had to do. You refused. You gave good reasons why you don't want to go because, but the bottom line is that God said to go. So you have to listen to God because obviously, obviously, God knows all these reasons and he's still telling you to go. So where do we find that he was punished? Where, what was the punishment? So we find in the Pesach afterwards, we over here by number three, God got angry at Moshe Rabbeinu. And the first opinion, number four, we don't find a Rosh, we don't find any punishment that was done because of it. The second opinion, number five, Aaron, Ochicha, Halevi. God told Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron, your brother, the Levi, Levite, he came, Moshe, and Aaron came from the shape of the third son of Yaakov Avinu, Levi. It was Ruvain, Shimon, Levi. So Levi, was divided into two. Like we talk about in Pesach, you know, the middle matzah you break into two because you had the Kahanim and the Levim. The house of Aaron, who came from Amram, that family divided into two. There were the Kahanim, the priests, and the Levim, the secondary <coughs> ones who served in the Holy Temple. They both were dedicated. They did not a, get a portion in the land of Israel. Every Shevet got a portion. Reuven got a portion. Shimon got a portion. Everybody got a portion, except for Levi, because they were dedicated to serve in the Holy Temple. The Gehanim was served every day. Of course, they took turns. Every family came every week. They took turns serving in the Temple. The Levim did their job, taking care of the singing. They had a whole orchestra in the Holy Temple. The Levian played the orchestra, a very sophisticated orchestra. They played every day. Even the Shabbos they played. We're not allowed to play music on Shabbos. But the Levian in the Holy Temple, even the Shabbos they played, the sophisticated, when they brought the sacrifices, it was a very happy place, the base of the Holy Temple. You walked inside, you heard music playing. The Levian were singing with their mouth, playing with their instruments. That was Levian's job taking care of the holy temple, of the doors, opening doors, closing doors, making sure things were clean and so on. So the Levim and the Kahana, they were dedicated to service of the holy temple. They had turns, every family. Uh, oh, yeah, they studied Torah, and their term came about twice, a, twice, a little more twice a year. Every family used to come for a week in the holy temple to serve Hashem, to do, take care of, to bring the korbanos and bring the sacrifices and so on to serve in the holy temple, and that Shevet did not get a portion of the land of Israel because they were too busy serving Hashem. They were not, could not plant and, 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 and sow and, and, and reap and harvest and so on. They were too busy serving Hashem. That was Shevet and teaching the Jewish people. That was their tafkid. That was their uh, purpose in life. Serve Hashem and, 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 and teach the Jewish people Torah. So the half of the Shevet was Kahanim, the priest who brought the sacrifices, and half of it was the Levian that took care 
of the other things in the Holy Temple. So, what happened over here was, Moshe Rabbeinu, he was from Shevet Levi. He was one of the Levi- Levites. He and Aaron. So Hashem told him, you know, you are the leader of the Jewish people, and you're taking them out of Egypt, taking them to Mount Sinai, taking the Torah for them. But you also, I wanted you to be the head priest, the Kohen Godel, the high priest, the Hanum to come from you. Just because you're so great, therefore you should get both. Be the leader and the high priest. But now, Aaron is going to take instead of you. That was the punishment he got, according to this opinion. That says, Aaron HaLevi. Aaron is supposed to be the Levi. And you're supposed to be the Kohen. But now, since I, you refused me, I keep pushing you to go and don't want to go. Therefore, I'm going to make him to be the Kohen and you'll be the Levi. And you won't get that high position that I want you to get. Of course, Moshe Bader was probably very happy. His brother was older than him. Uh, he got, because he doesn't want to go against God's word. But we don't know how he felt. How can we know how Moshe Bader felt? But that was the two opinions we have in the, uh, in the, in the Medrash of uh, what were the consequence of Moshe Rabbeinu was refusing to go, even though Hashem told him to go for seven days. One opinion is there was no consequence that Hashem did not punish him at all because he was in it for Aaron. And one opinion is that there was a, there was a punishment. Okay, so God finally gives in to Moshe Rabbeinu. He gives in to him. You don't want to go? Okay, so now Aaron is going to come and meet you. I'm telling him, Aaron was a prophet. Hashem said, go, and Moshe Rabbeinu is coming from Midian. Remember, let's get the, the geographics over here. Moshe Rabbeinu is not in Egypt now. Right? He ran away many, many years before because Pharaoh wanted to kill him because he killed the mitzvah. He killed the mitzvah. He was trying to kill the Jew. So they squealed on him, and they told on him, and Moshe Rabbeinu had to leave Egypt because Pharaoh wanted to kill him, was out after him. And he ran away to Midian, and that's where he got married with Zipporah, and that's where he was till now, for many years. More than 40, at least 40 years, maybe more than that. He was out of the land of Egypt, and now God told him to go back again. Aaron is still in Egypt, right? The Jewish people are still in Egypt, right? They weren't taken out yet. Moshe Rabbeinu ran away, and now Hashem says, go back, and I'm telling Aaron, your brother, to meet you. And now, what is supposed to happen now? So we have, he's going to meet you, he'll be happy, and quoting the Torah now, Barta Elov, you should speak to him, and you should put, Samtas Hadvar Befiv, put the words into his mouth. I'll be with your mouth, I'll be with his mouth, I'll make sure that you say the right thing and he says the right thing. You're going to the king, you're talking to the Jewish people, very, very important words, counted words. I'll give you the words to say. I'm writing the script. And I'll tell you what you should do and what you should say. He will speak for you on your behalf to the nation. Because you say you can't speak well. Okay, he'll be the one to speak. I know he's a great speaker. And he will be for you as a mouth. He'll be, he'll be your mouth. What does that mean? He'll be your mouth. We have another sheet over here. Six. I know that he is a good speaker. And you will, seven, you will put the words in his mouth and he'll be for you, your mouth. But you have to tell him. I'm going to tell you what to say and you'll tell him what to say. Why? Because we needed Moshe Rabbeinu, the great the great Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest man in the world, had to be involved with taking the Jewish people out of Egypt. Hashem wanted him to be only him involved. Moshe Rabbeinu refused, so Hashem said, okay, but you still have to be involved because we need your greatness to be behind this whole most important, well, second most important event of the world. The most important was giving Torah Mount Sinai. The, and, the, and the first second was taking the Jews, the Jews out of Egypt. Of course, you know, it's a toss-up, which is a greater event, but uh, depending on how you look at it. But 
Moshe would have to be involved. If he wouldn't be involved, Aaron, Aaron would not, no, he's not great enough to do it. He had to have the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu to be the leader. And even though he got out of speaking directly to Pharaoh, but indirectly he spoke to him, I, he will be your mouth. In other words, I'm going to tell you what to say. You will tell Aaron what to say. And he'll speak because he's a good speaker. You don't want to speak because you say you can't speak well. You're t- defective in your speech. So we spoke about last week why it was that way. But since you are refusing to go to speak, I will give you the words to say. You will give the words over to Aaron, and he'll be the one to speak to the king and to the Jewish people. He's your mouth. In other words, you are the one supposed to be saying it. You're giving the words to say, but he'll say it. It's something like if, uh, like a loudspeaker. You allowed to be talking about who's talking. The person is talking, but people hear the loudspeaker, even though the person behind it is talking, but you're hearing the words from the left. The same thing, Moshe Rabbeinu is talking through Aaron. It's called the Maturgamon in the words of the, of, of the, of the Talmud, the Gemara. He is, the, they used to, as a matter of fact, they used to have live loudspeakers. That's what we used to have, there were no loudspeakers. What happened to somebody was a loud voice, he didn't have a loud voice. He used to take a person with a loud voice, stand next to him, and he would say what he has to say, and then the person next would say with a loud voice to everybody to hear. <laughs> there were human loudspeakers that used to have in the olden times, and that's really what was happening basically over here. Moshe Rabbeinu was talking, but Avon Kai was giving out his words to the Jewish people who had to speak to them, and to Pyro what he had to speak to him. And that's what we have over here. He will be number, number eight. He be, will be your mouth. And I'm giving into you the request that I would go instead of you. But not, go together. The main problem was his speech. He'll, make, he'll be able to speak to you. OK, so now we got the plan all set. So you think, okay, time to go. We've got to take the Jews out of Egypt. What happens? Not so fast. Moshe went, number nine, he went back to his father-in-law. Remember, Yisra was his father-in-law. He was living by him, right? He came to Midian. He met the daughters by the well. And Yisra said, bring Moshe to the house. Maybe he'll marry one of you. He married one of the da- seven daughters of Yisra. He was married to Sipora. And he was living by Yisra. He went back to Why did he go back to Yisra? Hashem told him to go. You, you, you agreed to go already. You go with Aaron. You're going together. So go. We've got to take the Jews out. Quick. No, he had to go back. Why did he have to go back to Yisra for? Number 10. Lito v'shus. Akar asatoy. He can't just go without talking to Yisrael. Look what Yisrael did for him. He was running away from Egypt. He had no place to live, no place to go. He ran to Midian. And Yisrael took him into his house. He married his daughter. He had a place to stay, a place to live. And he stayed there for many years. He had a lot of hakaras hatoiv, of appreciation, whatever the Decided to get permission to leave because it's great appreciation to Israel. He had to make sure, as a etiquette, as being a mensch, you just don't run away. Somebody just uh, took you into his house when you were desolate. desolate you, were de- you, you had you had nothing with you. You're all by yourself. He took you into the house. You have to go to him and say, "Listen, I have to go to, to Egypt." Give me permission to go. It's only in the, in the it's, it's more of a, 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 not that he expected him to say no, but it's just a der It's a way of, of, of decent action, decency. But somebody who was so nice to you, you just don't re- walk out on him without telling him about it. You say, well, what do you think? Is it okay with you? I go, I've been so many years together. So you go back. So from here we learned a very important lesson. Even though it has something very important to do, but we can't forget our obligations to other people. Not just, well, I have to do it, run and do it, what do you care? I have to, it's important. No, no, no. You have to make sure that everything 
every detail is covered. And every person is covered. And the person will be upset. He ran away and didn't even tell me about it. And you lived in my house. I took you in and you don't care to tell me. That would be terrible. You couldn't, you, you couldn't go to take the Jews out of Egypt like that. It would be a big uh, a, a, a complaint to get Moshe Rabbeinu. You have to be a decent person. So even though you're going to do this great, important, outstanding, exciting, out-of-the-world action, take the Jews out of Egypt, but don't forget the details. Don't forget the other people involved. Don't forget the different feelings of other people. You have to make sure that every, every corner is covered, every detail is covered. And, and if he went without talking to Yisrael first, it would be a big complaint against him, and it wouldn't be Moshe Rabbeinu. So first he went back to Israel to make sure that he's going to get his permission and get his blessing for him to go to, the, to Egypt to leave. So we, there's a lot of great lessons we're learning from these psukim. That's what we learn Chumash for, to learn lessons. It's time. Okay. It's time. Let's go. It's over time. Okay. Questions in the room? Okay. Lots of online questions. Let's see what we get in the room. From the DU chat, what's the point of uh, people feeling for other people and being mishtatev in their tzar and, and their feelings if they don't even know about it? What, are they, what do those people gain from it? Or do they not need to get it? Okay, the question is, we say it was a wonderful thing that uh, Moshe felt for his fellow brethren, but they didn't know about it. So what does, it, what does that accomplish? Well, um, it accomplishes for the person himself. The person himself who feels for the other person, he's part of a nation, part of the Jewish nation. Uh, even people are not alive anymore. Uh, if you go to Yad Vashem, we talked about a few weeks ago, and, and some of you went, went to Yad Vashem the last time we had some hands raised up. And you see the things the Jews went through, you read about it. She just, well, okay, it's, uh, it's history. What's that have to do with me? No, we have to feel bad because... It makes us part of a Jewish nation. It makes us part of, of being God's nation. We're together. We're all one. And it's not maybe helping the person we feel bad about, but it's helping ourselves that we are as one nation and we feel proud to be this nation and we're God's nation and uh, we want to feel that we're all one together. And what, what some of the pain that some person went through, if I feel that pain, then I'm part of the nation together. And therefore... I'll be more active to help other people that are alive today because we're all one nation. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll feel closer to Hashem because we feel Hashem is our God and we're the nation of, of Hashem and we're all together in everything that happens and therefore God is close to us like we're close to everybody else and makes it a, a difference to us ourselves as feeling uh, this, this closeness to others. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. We always say, carry the yoke of somebody else. Means if you can help them, put yourself under the yoke with them. But we always say, but in case they're not available to, but at least we should feel for them, is definitely two, two, two things. Okay, we have an online question from Sam from Jackson. He was going to buy life insurance. And somebody told him that it's a lack of faith in God to buy life insurance. And his response was, I go to work to earn a living. I don't say God's going to provide for me. So why if, should I not buy life insurance and just say, that? If, is it the same thing? Saying, my, oh, God's going to take care of my family? Or do I do something to make sure that my family is taken care of? Well, um, there's two things uh, to consider. This is a very big question by many people. People have real faith in God. Why should I buy life insurance? Why should I buy uh, uh, hospital insurance for that matter? Uh, I've discussed it with the great Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, and uh, we discussed uh, having hospital insurance, doctor insurance, uh, health insurance, and he said that definitely...
have because thing is uh, frequent to happen, we have to do our status, we call it, and do not depend on miracles. And people today, doctors put people in the hospital very readily today, and it's a thing that is uh, happening all the time, and we have to uh, not rely on miracles, and we have to take the right steps to uh, not rely on God for miracles. We don't want, uh, God doesn't want us to rely on miracles. We're not great enough for that. <laughs> so, <coughs> so it comes to life insurance, uh, it's really uh, the same thing because people don't live forever. And uh, to that, we find some people who do not have life insurance and others have to take up the slack. And some people, God forbid, some people don't live uh, forever naturally. Some people uh, even leave their world when they're younger and they have families and uh, who's going to take care of those families? So they have to make a big collection for them and go around collecting from people in order for them to have, uh, uh, take care of the children uh, for now and for afterwards and get married and so on. And people have very great uh, complaints about that. Why do you do this to us? You could have gotten life insurance, taken care of your family, and now we have to go around collecting and, 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 and it's such a big uh, to-do to collect money for people. So I tell people that uh, because of this reason uh, that Shh. they uh, have no right to go without life insurance because we have another cloud that we have, can't be talking on somebody else's husband. There's a person who will say, I'd be talking. I have faith in God will take care of me. But you can't have faith in God to take it on somebody else. For yourself, you want to be a righteous person, they have betochen, they have faith in God, they don't have to do things. But don't say, because you have faith in God, he'll take care of them, that's take care of you. Take care of them, that's not up to you. So therefore, it comes to some the person, you can't be betochen. My rabbi says, betochen, the end of the you can't have. So this is something that uh, we uh, accept to have all types of insurances, not to be excessively, but what's considered by the world a, 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 a right amount for the type of insurance to have, which is, uh, uh, will be uh, sufficient to, to take care of what has to be taken care of, whether it's hospital, doctors, life. We say that uh, God says, don't rely on miracles. We have to, just like the man said, we have to go to work to make a livelihood. We can't expect the money to fall into the house by itself. The same thing when it comes to insurance. That is the mainstream opinion of most rabbis today. Okay, questions in the room? Oh, we got a question in the back. Take it away. Is there any specific reason why you're supposed to eat dairy on Shavuos? Ah, okay. He's getting ahead of himself a little bit. We're halfway to Shavuos, as Rabbi Min said. And uh, there seems to be a custom that many have to eat dairy or dairy meal on Shavuos. Is there a reason for it? Or what the reason, what's the reason for it? Well, there's a, there's a Kabbalistic reasons which we don't discuss. We don't know a Kabbalah of hidden mis 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 mystical reasons. But uh, this plain, simple reason which is given was because the Jews, when they got the Torah, they got all the laws of keeping kosher. And uh, all of their vessels that they used till then were no good, were trafe, anything they, uh, uh, of course, that's about the month, but whatever, that they had uh, uh, food prepared from before in a not kosher way, they didn't have the Torah yet. Now they got the turds, oh, they, they meet the milk together, and they had uh, animals in the and so on. So all the dishes were, they had to throw them out. They had to get new dishes or make them kosher. So it was very difficult to uh, prepare uh, meat meals without the proper cooking utensils and so on. And it's much easier to prepare dairy meals uh, without uh, the proper vessels. You just take milk from the cow, and you drink the milk and make a little cheese, whatever it is. So the remembrance of the giving a Torah Mount Sinai, which was difficult to prepare meat meals, uh, to prepare the dairy meals, that's why we that remember that. That's why we have the dairy food on, on, on the shoes. Okay. We have an online question. Um, actually, when my Torah made asked me this question recently also. Is it, if it's important to lead a healthy lifestyle, why are so many Jews not careful about it? Or more, more, more accurately, why are so many traditional Jewish foods like kishka and chalent 
why are they not quite on pastrami, you know? Um, fatty, nice, thick, heavy, thick, fatty pastrami. Why are they not like on the uh, recommended eating list? Well, I will not uh, stop eating kishka. What did you tell him? Let's see. He asked you, what did you tell him? What did you answer him? Tell him you do it. What's normal? This was normal. So this is normal. Yeah. That's what I said. Shem Pesayim Hashem. That was my answer then, basically. Well, we're supposed to eat healthy food. What is healthy? We know that what's healthy today in the health books is not healthy tomorrow. To keep changing it all the time. Right? Remember a few years ago, eggs, eggs, oh, yeah, eggs, be careful, eggs, only eggs, are crazy. once a week, twice a week, eggs. Today, they said, no, it's okay to eat eggs, the crystal is okay. Uh, Rabbi Mintz yeah. Jr., listen to this, we're going to come out with an Ura cookbook soon. So many of the foods... Ura traditional Jewish food cookbook. Many of the foods that with yesterday was no good, today they are good, you can change it back and forth. So really, uh, the main uh, rule to keep is don't be excessive in anything. Eat anything normally, not in the excess. If you have some pastrami, you can eat pastrami, it's okay. But don't eat a lot of it. Don't eat uh, five, uh, five uh, femishes a day or uh, a lot of kishka, uh, uh, ten portions of kishka. Eat it in, in, a, in, in, a, in a moderation. Moderation. And if you eat in moderation, you won't go wrong. Guaranteed, you won't go wrong. It's, uh, the, the problem is people get uh, carried away and they eat foods they shouldn't eat. And, uh, it's, uh, and, and if it's excessive, then it can have a bad effect on your health. But if you have a, once a week Shabbos and you eat a chont and you eat some kishka and Shabbos and some pastrami and Shabbos, nothing's going to happen to you. Just uh, keep it in moderation and you'll be as healthy as your best doctor. Okay. Moshe. Moshe, have a... Back from Houston, Texas. Okay. Houston, you went, you went to the food funeral in Houston. Have uh, Austin. 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 I have a question, a little political question. You know, the Israeli government don't allow the Jews to pray on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. What do you think about it? They don't allow us to pray there. The government. Okay, um, the government and the rabbis don't allow Jews to pray on the Western, on the, on the Temple Mount. So Moshe wants to know what Rabbi Mintz thinks about the uh, government not letting. And I think Rabbi Mintz should explain why the rabbis don't let. Yeah. Well, um, they have two different reasons. The rabbis don't let because there are parameters and are stop signs where Jews are not allowed to go on the Temple Mount. <coughs> in <coughs> when the Holy Temple was standing, there's certain laws prohibiting people with certain tumma. It's called tumma. It's called spiritual uncleanliness. A person touches dead body, for instance, or certain dead animals. Uh, different types of tumma that people have to rid themselves of the tumma before they're allowed to go into the Holy Temple. And therefore, today, which we don't have the right facilities to take off that tumor, that spiritual uncleanliness, therefore, we're not allowed to go too close to the holy, where the Holy Temple stood. <coughs> and Harabais is one of those places, a certain place that we have to stop going because we are not uh, prepared in a spiritual, holy way, going to a mikveh and having the red heifer ashes and so on, to make us uh, take off that tumor that, uh, that spiritually uncleanliness. So therefore, that's why the rabbis say, we can go this far, but not any further. The government also has very good reasons why, because the Arabs are very uh, adamant, choose not to go there, and they're going to start uh, and, uh, the, uh, a, a, a whole problem and, and making uprisings against the Jews. What do they, what do they call it again? Intifada. Intifada. <laughs> So uh, I remember now, a few weeks ago when I was in Israel, and we went to, uh, to Miron, where the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried. Not Miron, Hebron. Hebron, right, Hebron, where the patriarchs are. And Avraham uh, Yaakov, and 
Sar, Rivka, and Leia are laid to rest. And as you know, the Arabs don't allow the Jews to go into the uh, Ohel of Yitzchok and Rivka. Only a certain holidays, Jewish holidays. And uh, they're barred from going. They go to the Ohel of Ram, of Ansara, Yaakov and Leah, but they don't allow Yitzchok and the Jews to go in there, the wise guys, the terrible. It makes me very upset that they, they have to tell us what to do. Yitzchok and Rivka. But anyway, that's what it is. So, so we were standing there, and uh, they have a, a doorway, how to get in there. So the soldier's standing there. So I told him, uh, well, let me, I can take a peek inside what's going on over there. So he said, okay, you can take a look. You open the door a little bit, and there's another door inside. And we look inside, they see the bears and praying over there. And I said to him, uh, uh, I want to go in there. I, I really didn't mean it, but I just wanted to start to output a little bit. He said, if you go in there, you'll start into Fada. You, if you go in there, you can't, they'll be so angry, the Jews going in, you're not allowed to go in there. And all of a sudden, over his radio comes out, as his commander must have heard that, he says, close that door. He screamed at him, because let me open the first door, let me open the second door. And he started yelling at him, he got all scared, and his commander found out, I guess he watched over the closed TV circuit, whatever, and he told him, you better close that door, because, so it, it, they're very, uh, very, uh, uh, sensitive to the Jews going places that they don't want to go. It's very upsetting to us, but uh, we don't want to start any intifadas and any bloodshed, so therefore we have to be careful and not to, uh, to, uh, to start up with the Arabs and make them st starting uh, uprisings and throwing rocks and people getting hurt. So that's the reason for it. Some people say, who cares? Who cares about the Arabs go anyway? But we don't want people to get hurt. Okay, online question. We have actually two online questions about pets tonight. So I'll about put them together. Pets, dogs, pets cats. Pets. Do dogs and cats or other pets have souls? That's question number one. Question number two is, somebody is uh, dog sitting their grandfather's dog. Um, they don't usually have a dog in their house. They want to know if it's a problem to learn to study Torah or pray in the same room as the dog. <laughs> and if they have to wash their hands after they touch the dog. Um, dogs, animals do not have souls. They don't live forever. Um, kosher animals eaten by human beings have a connection to eternity and not to a soul, but through the nefesh abahami, through the life that they live and being a part of a human being, there's some kind of connection to the future, but not through a soul. They don't have a soul. Uh, if you have an animal in the room, you're allowed to learn with the animal in the room, as long as there's not a bad odor in the room. And if you touch a dog, you don't have to wash your hands, no. Okay. Another question in the room? What kind of question? Why am I? Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> if the... If the Levium were praising Hashem, why does it seem like they got um, their piece of land taken away instead of given to them as a punishment? Okay, so the question is a very good one. If the Levites spent their days serving God and uh, in the service of in the divine service, so it seems they should get a bigger portion of the land, not that they should get their portion of the land taken away from them. Yeah. It seems like they were punished instead of being rewarded. No. God says, Ani I am your inheritance. I am your property. They, it's a great honor for them. They, getting land in, 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 the, in, the, in Israel, they had certain cities that they had to live in and to uh, take care of their uh, uh, different uh, needs that they had. They had some land. But the main purpose given to live is people to plant and to grow crops. And that they were not into because they were busy serving Hashem. They didn't need the land. It was not, they, the land was in order to grow, and they needed, whatever they needed, they got the cities. They had enough to have housing, and to, uh, they had around the city uh, uh, parks. They had parks around the city. They had beautiful cities they had, parks and place to do their basic needs, to park their car, to park their animals, and so on. They had very nice cities, a very... Uh, uh, open areas, places to live in. 
but they did not need to get a regular portion of the land that was for those who were planting and raising crops, and they did not raise crops. So it was not taken away from them. It wasn't a punishment. It was an honor for them that they were the ones that were outstanding and specified to, look, to do God's uh, work, so to speak, and God's messengers, and that was an honor for them that they didn't get the land because they were serving Hashem. Well, I think you have to point out that the other Jews were required to give them give them food, give, provide them with things. They got miser, they got a tenth of all the crops. Yeah, right. yeah, they, they, so uh, the other them. Jews were supporting them. They weren't, the other Jews had an obligation to support them. They weren't uh, left out in the cold. They were supported not in a uh, putting down way, but, but not like the poor people uh, asking for handouts. This was an honor for the Jewish people to support them because uh, they needed them to be close to Hashem. They were the, uh, Shevet, the connecting the Jews to Hashem was Shevet Levi, so it was an honor for the Jewish people to support them, not as beggars, but as people higher than them, more important, and they, and they uh, were, had the honor to help them. Okay. Aaron Cohn has an email. Did Jacob receive prophecy while in Laban's house? I know it's a little out of season. I'm not exactly sure why this question's coming up now. But did J Jacob receive prophecy when he was in, in his father-in-law's house? Well, we see that uh, he uh, did when he was told to leave, uh, that the Hashem appeared to him and said he should leave Lovin's house. So we got this, uh, certain that time he, uh, he, was, uh, he got prophecy. Also, he says that he saw in his dream that taking the end was one place or the other. So it was a... Uh, a level of prophecy that he had in Laban's house. It wasn't the highest, uh, the different levels of prophecy, and uh, it wasn't the highest level, but it was definitely a level of prophecy that he had. Hashem told him to leave. He called up Rochel in the field and told him about the prophecy they had to leave, which they agreed to him. So he did have prophecy there on a certain level. Okay. Second round, quickly? No? Okay. So, question is, from a guy in a relatively light blue suit, Question is, what what, light blue suit? What? Guy wearing a relatively light blue suit. The question is, why do so many ultra orthodox men dress only in black and white? It's really boring. I agree. <laughs> uh, well, the, uh, the the wearing black is uh, considered a type of humble kind of color. It's not the very flashy and loud, colorful clothes protect more attention. And uh, since Jews are the uh, nation of Hashem, and we humble ourselves in front of Hashem, so black is considered, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's not considered a poor kind of color. It's not considered uh, something which is uh, 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 showing uh, lack of, uh, of, of greatness. But it's, it has both to it, a certain class to it, black, but it's not loud, like other colors. So it has a double uh, uh, significance to it. It's considered a, 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 a it's conservative kind of way to dress, but it's also considered an uh, uh, a important way of, of, uh, of uh, it has a certain spirit to it, black. And it's not loud, but it's it's considered uh, 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 royal in a way, and uh, therefore that's why Jews, since they're humble people, we don't want to put on clothing that attracts attention, different colors. So that's why Jewish people wear black. Not Jewish people. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's an obligation, but that's just a a tradition of many people to go that way because of that reason. Because it's a more of a conservative kind of uh, color, and not uh, and not to attract attention. Okay, Rami right, says in the past discussed cremation, and what's wrong with it, and uh, why we don't do it. The question is, if somebody specifically requests to be cremated, do we honor their dying wish? And if somebody's father requested to be cremated, is it the son's obligation to disobey his father? Yes, we're told that even though there is a great mitzvah of the Torah of honoring one's parents, one of the most important mitzvahs in the Torah, uh, but not if parents tell a child to go against God, against the Torah. 
because the parent has to listen to God also. You have a, good, a child has the parent over them, but the parent has God over them, and the parent has to listen to God before the parent. So if the parent tells the child to do something against the Torah, there's no obligation, there's no mitzvah to listen to the parent. And therefore, we find this very often today that parents tell, leave a uh, will that they want to be cremated, and the children are, are not obligated to keep that wish because there's no doubt after the person dies, they themselves are crying over the fact they let's left such a will because it's very, very bad for a person to be cremated. Because for Tchiyas HaMesim, we believe that all the Jewish people will stand up, those worthy of it, at the time with the resurrection of the dead, the dead people come alive and live forever, and uh, the person who's cremated is going to have a hard time getting up at that time because a certain part of the body that it's built up from that part, and if it's burned, it's, it's being a hard time to build up the body again. So those people live that, believe that uh, will to be cremated, they themselves are very upset after they die to realize what a terrible thing, mistake that they made. So the child not listening to them is really, their parents are begging them, please don't listen to me, because they are suffering for leaving, leaving such a will. And uh, the child definitely is not obligated to listen to them for that, and he's not allowed to do it, and he should do everything possible not to let it happen. A lot of parents live that uh, will, and a lot of p children who have ways of getting out of it, and that's the best thing for the parents after they die to realize it when it's too late. Okay. So, can we have a couple of uh, malachi questions so we can ignore those? Questions in the room? Ah, mazal. Last question of the evening. Rabbi, uh, in the 49 days until Shavuot, you are not allowed to shave and all kinds of uh, restrictions. So the Ashkenaz until Lagba Omer, they can shave. And no, the no, no, not the Lagba Omer. Or, or the opposite. Till Mishchodesh ear. A lot of shave till Mishchodesh ear. Okay. Okay, maybe I meant that this has to do with several of the questions that we got, um, actually. Um, what has to do with uh, shaving and the stubble and what, what's a, what kind of shaving? Is it just applied to men's beards? And uh, it's really uncomfortable and people look unkempt. Maybe I meant could explain what this business with the shaving is and haircuts, if it applies to haircuts, and what the different customs are. Cause well... <laughs> The certain amount of days uh, have to be kept, 49 days. The question is, when you start counting those days? Some 33 days. Th th 30, uh, 33, well, 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 yeah. The 30, so count to 33, start counting from the beginning of Pesach until Lag that's 33. And some people start from Rosh Chodesh Iyer, and uh, if they go past Lag Bomer, to have those 33 days. So... Oh, he wants to know why some people are like this, some people are like that. Well, the uh, simple reason why uh, you don't start from the beginning is because that's Yom Tov. And uh, that's only restrictions. You don't see any... You're supposed to have a velus to show uh, mourning. So they don't start from uh, uh, that time because the, the mourning is... You can't do any mourning on Yom Tov. So therefore, in Nisan, you can't do mourning on Nisan. So therefore, that's why those people start from Shchodes Iyer, because uh, they, they can't show any mourning from before. Um, the other people start from them, because from, from that period, because they feel that uh, at that time, that's when the uh, Talmudim died at, at, at those times, until like, boy, they stopped. So therefore, they uh, count those days also, because a lot of times you count certain days of mourning, even during Yom Tov, you count a certain shloshim and so on, but certain things you count. So uh, the, it's, it's much easier to understand why we start from those who start from Shkodesh Ir because they can't have any morning from before. Why they start from before, I don't know. What, uh, because you can't do any morning from before in Yom Tov. So uh, they must feel that that's when they died because Chazal said with 33 days, they started dying then. So past that time, they didn't die. So there's no person to mourn anymore. So therefore, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't count that. So, but uh, as far as taking hair, so therefore, uh, the uh, uh, times of mourning, 
with, with, with certain things we don't do, uh, taking haircuts, and uh, so shaving is a question whether that's included in taking haircuts or not. So uh, because it's not really uh, uh, the hair doesn't Shh. grow so long, and therefore it's not called a haircut. That's a halakhali is a whole question since it's like it's like you're cleaning your face. It's not considered like uh, taking a haircut since uh, the 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 hair that grows on the face is very short. So it's not considered. But haircuts are certainly haircut. forbidden. What? Somebody was asking if haircuts, if it's only shaving, but haircuts are certainly forbidden. Haircuts are forbidden, but right. the question of shaving is included in, in the, uh, called taking a haircut or not. Even it's hair, but it's very short, so it's not considered, it's like, like, it's like you have a dirty face, like it's, it doesn't grow that much yet. So, halakhically, it has to grow a certain uh, size in order to be considered uh, cutting, cutting the hair. As far as cutting, you know, with a razor, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated uh, halakha thing. But so, therefore, some people, when it's uh, difficult to, to, to go like that, and the job, it would be very uncomfortable for them for the work that they go. So, there is a uh, reason to permit to take a shave, even not a haircut, because that's not cold in your hair, it's just so short. Uh, does that cover all the bases you want to I think so. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. We hope to see you next week. And Myra is in the shul in five minutes. Have a good night, everybody. See you next week. And don't forget to work on our character trait.